And this is nothing less than an attempt to steal the election. High drama on the dais. You've been played by a lot of people. Basically a secret investigation that he was involved with. Voters will versus political roadblocks. The mayor here live. The first duty of government is to protect its citizens. Broward 911, outdated and understand. This is the most important thing for our public is to answer a phone. We want to have dispatchers personnel that are the best of the best that can. The commission set to hear details this week. The bill, as amended, has passed. Respect for Marriage Act. So yesterday's decision was enormous. The Senate says yes. Florida senators voted no. I would have not done it. I would have not invited them. Dining with anti-Semites. Donald Trump shouldn't have done that. The news and the newsmakers this week, this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin with the power of the vote and a challenge to it. As we come on the air this morning, some residents have no representation in their city almost a month after Election Day. That city is Fort Lauderdale, and the problem involves a high-stakes tug-of-war, political and legal, between the city commission candidate elected by the voters and opposition to seating him by the mayor and one other commissioner. At the heart of the dispute is a question of whether winning candidate John Herbst met the residency requirements laid out in the Fort Lauderdale City Charter. He says he did. A simple question that has blown up into political drama. Local 10's Trent Kelly starts us off. Trent. Well, Glenna, this political drama seemed to blow up even more last week when Mayor Dean Trantalis wrote a letter to the state attorney general asking her to weigh in on the matter. This has left Earp's constituents without any representation, something that will continue as this political drama continues to play out. My district is without representation right now, and this is nothing less than an attempt to steal the election. Will he or won't he swear in this week? Voters elected John Earps to the Fort Lauderdale Commission last month, beginning the attempt since to keep him from taking office. Mayor Dean Trentalis alleges Erbst doesn't meet residency requirements. Erbst has evidence that he does, but the question is complicated by some context and history. Last February, the mayor led the termination of Erbst from his job as Fort Lauderdale city auditor. Erbst was investigating potential waste and wrongdoing in city government. Then in last month's commission election, Mayor Trentalis backed one of Erbst opponents. Now, one of those losing candidates allege the mayor's office is working against Erbst swearing in. You've been played by a lot of people. That voicemail and similar texts are said to be from the mayor's chief of staff to a candidate who first challenged Erbst win, but then withdrew. Why is the mayor's office interjecting themselves in Chris Williams' challenge and his decision to withdraw? And a city spokesperson telling Local 10 News that while Williams did withdraw his affidavit, they're not aware of any change in status to the other challenge that was presented by that other candidate. Reporting for This Week in South Florida from Pembroke Park, I'm Trent Kelly, Local 10 News. Hey, Trent, thanks very much. All right, on Tuesday, the mayor and commission are scheduled to decide what is the next step they're going to make. And Mayor Dean Trantalis is here with us live to get into all of that. Mayor, great to have you. Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Glenna. Great to see you. All right, so allow me to get right to the chase. It seems like you as the mayor have your thumb on the scale of this election, which you are free to do if you like, but John Herbst was elected by the voters, d does seem to have all the documentation he needs. What's the issue here? Well, a lot of what you said in your promo is not accurate. So let's just back step. Tell us. Um, on November 8th, there was an election for this district one, the city, of, uh, city commission of Fort Lauderdale. Okay. And uh, Mr. Herbst won by almost 40% in, in a field of four uh, candidates who ran for that office. Um, the day after that election, I ran into Mr. Herbst here in City Hall, and I congratulated him. I shook his hand and I said, uh, John, I'm looking forward to working with you. Um, we may not agree on everything, but we certainly agree that we're, we're both interested in, the, in doing the, what's right for the city. Uh, a day or two later, uh, one of the other, two of the other candidates, um, Mr. Keechel and Mr. Williams, 
both filed an affidavit contesting Mr. Herb's eligibility to even run for that office because of certain allegations they made in their in their affidavit. Uh, Mr. Williams subsequently withdrew his affidavit. He was threatened by some people and he just didn't want to be involved anymore. So Mr. Keechel apparently kept his affidavit in and that's the way the charter reads. The charter reads if you contest an election due to eligibility, you you submit an affidavit indicating what those uh, what those claims are. Mayor, now, did you have anything to do with those challenges? Because it looks like the texts that were in Trent Kelly's report right there, um, we actually printed it out here. It, it looks like the texts were coming from your office, um, your chief of staff. Did you have anything to do with those challenges? I had nothing to do with the challenges. It's totally up to the candidates, and I indicated that uh, we will, we need to define what is eligibility. The charter of Fort Lauderdale says that you must maintain your residence in order to be eligible to run for office. Now, that's well, kind well, of Mr. Mayor, let me, let me, jump, if I, um, I beg your pardon, let me jump in here. I'm no yes. expert on the Fort Lauderdale city charter, but essentially says you have to have lived within the city for six months to qualify for office. It's really a little bit vague. And the supervisor of elections has certified that Mr. Herbst, and he showed a lease that he signed in April, which would indicate that indeed he has been a resident of the city of Fort Lauderdale for at least six months. So those statements are true, but it goes beyond those statements. Michael, the reality is that if we just allowed anybody to walk into the city, get an apartment, even though they live somewhere else, it it it's just begs for voter fraud and candidate election fraud. Okay, so let me just wait, inform wait, let me just, let me the rest finish. of South wait, Florida let me Mayor. Just finish. Mayor, this is a man who worked for the city as an auditor for 16 years who was summarily fired by you and others uh, for essentially doing his job, just investigations you didn't know about, and was retiring north and decided to run for commission and rented an apartment and now lives in the city. And there's process right. and detail, but essentially he did provide documentation. So he's not really, as, as I'm sure you'll agree, anyone off the street just coming to run for commission. No, I didn't say off the streets. I, what I'm in, what I, if I can be allowed to conclude, the reality is that when he, when he terminated his employment here with the city, he, he even stated uh, right after the meeting that he had planned to retire and move to another county, which he did, by the way. Within the last couple of years, he sold his house in Fort Lauderdale. He moved to Highlands County, and he registered that house as his homestead, which he currently maintains as his homestead. Mm -hmm. So the question is, when you have a homestead, is that your primary residence, yeah. or is that not your primary yeah, residence? So Mr. look, Mr. the city Mayor, commission is going to make that decision yeah. on Tuesday. There are a lot of competing factors. Yeah. He he has his voter registration here. He has his driver's license here, all past the six-month period, which which makes it him more eligible to be a candidate. So these are variables. Unfortunately, the, the laws are not so uh, black and white. There's a lot of wiggle room in this, and we're going to do our best. The community is demanding that we do the best, and we're going to move on, and the city of Fort Lauderdale will continue to thrive as it has for many, many years. Yeah. Uh Mayor, uh, it seems to me I read a letter by your city attorney, Alan Boileau, that seemed to say a lot of these questions are really moot and that uh, Mr. Herbst should be sworn in on Tuesday. Is that that is his legal opinion, is it not? I'm not sure which email you read, uh, but that has not been his opinion up to now. And so, you know, you and I must be reading different opinions. Yeah, well, right what now, about... What, what about the opinion you asked from the uh, state attorney general without sort of you did an end run around your own city attorney? Why did you ask the uh, state attorney general for an opinion? Because I thought that Mr. Boileau should not alone be burdened with the interpretation of what a clause says in our charter. I, would, I wanted to hear from our attorney general what goes on in other cities, other counties throughout the state in interpreting what residence means. I thought it was a pretty fair question to ask, and I thought that it's an issue that needs to be resolved one way or the other. And I really believe that um, I, I didn't want to involve Mr. Boileau because he's, he's given his opinions, and, and I wanted to be able to corroborate whatever he said with uh, the authority coming from the attorney general's office. I think that's only fair for everybody, don't you? 
And have you heard from Madam Attorney General? Have you gotten a response? We have not heard back, and I suspect we won't hear back by Tuesday anyway. But um, going forward, I would at least like to hear what her interpretation is for future elections to make sure that that we have election integrity here in Broward County, here in Fort Lauderdale. I think everyone is looking for that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Mr. Mayor, I don't know the entire history and I don't know that it's all that important. But the fact of the matter is that Mr. Herbst for 16 years seems to have been a very fine city auditor. But then he started investigating your then police chief because the police chief had a side job as a uh, NCAA referee, apparently was very good at it, but it was a second job and under his contract, he wasn't allowed to have a second job and you got really kind of PO'd at Herbst because he did the investigation on his own without asking your permission. Is that right? Some of that is correct. First of all, yes, Mr. Herbst has been our city auditor in the city for a number of years. I have not always agreed with his points of view. In fact, uh, a number of major topics and issues that have come before this commission, uh, I've, I could not agree with uh, his approach. And so it's not to say that, you know, his, his tenure with the city was um, uh, in keeping with my philosophy and what, what's in the best interest of the city. Yeah. But I don't want to rehash that. And if you want to talk about what happened that night when he revealed that he was doing a secret investigation against our police chief, um, the reality is Mr. Herbst went on to refer to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and they just pushed it back and said they're not interested because they said it was insignificant and unimportant. So there, there is little details here. The point is we're going to come to a conclusion on Tuesday whatever's in the best interest of the city of Fort Lauderdale is what we're all going to agree upon and we're going to move, continue to move this city forward. So rehashing history of 16, 17 years yeah. is not going to get us there. So, so what do you think is going to happen on Tuesday? With this and we're going to make, we're going to make sure something happens. So how is this going to be resolved on Tuesday? Do you think? Well, it all depends what evidence is provided. You know, the evidence is going to show that he maintains his homestead in Highlands even to this day. Uh, his, the evidence is going to show that, that he has his driver's license and his voter registration that he secured s at least six months prior to election day. So there's some intent to show that his, his residency may actually have been reverted back to Fort Lauderdale, even though he still maintains his legal homestead in Highlands. So mm -hmm. that was kind of what I was hoping to hear from the attorney general. Can you claim a residence, a primary residence, in one location and yet still have a homestead registration in another location? I think that's a fair question to ask and I think we all need to know the answer. You know, Mayor, a lot of people outside of Fort Lauderdale are gonna be watching to see what happens when the voter elects someone with these kind of issues that you've been talking about. So we appreciate your time and thank you so Mayor much. Mayor Trantella, it's great sure. to see you. Thanks very much. Thank you, enjoy the rest of your day. Same. Thank you. Up next, the one call people in trouble make and expect an answer. Broward's new mayor is going to join us to explain what is next for the county's troubled 911 system. When you have a crisis of some kind, a health emergency, an auto accident, a bad fall, you call 911. Broward's serious failures in call response involve unanswered calls. According to County Commission report, 12% went unanswered last year. The problems appear to be a, so a shortage of personnel and a clash about who should be running the 911 call center. Right now, the county is in charge of the system, but the Broward Sheriff's Office does the daily operations. The Broward Commission is set to address that conflict when it meets on Tuesday. Lamar Fisher is Broward's brand new mayor, got the gavel this week for the next year. He is a county commissioner for District 4, most of Northeast Broward. New mayor, <laughs> welcome. Are we your first interview as the new mayor of Broward County? Love that. Hey, thank you, Michael and Glenda, for having me this morning to be able to talk about this, this particular issue. Mayor Fisher, we're glad you are with us. Well, we need not recall to you, you have heard chapter and voice, I'm sure from some of your constituents, how frustrated and angry uh, some people are about how shoddy the 911 system is in Broward. How are you going to fix it? Well, first of all, I want to thank the media actually for bringing it to our attention several months ago. 
in which we had some horrible, horrific um, things happen with the 911 system. So we were able to immediately engage the Broward Sheriff's Office and the county to see how we can immediately, on a short-term basis, fix that problem. And that's what we exactly did. We found out that we had a tremendous amount of shortage of call takers in our system. So we obviously Broward Sheriff's Office runs that system for us. As you said, the technology side is the Broward County side. But we wanted to immediately fix that issue. So we uh, acquiesced to the sheriff's request and first gave them $4 million to do some additional hiring, increase pay, increase benefits. And then this year we increased the budget to $11.5 million so we can fill those positions to be able to answer the calls that are so needed. There were about 80 positions that need to be filled and our latest numbers were about 11.5% vacancy right now. So Mayor, uh, credit where credit is due, the people at the Sun Sentinel actually did that expose last spring yeah. and that had resulted in the commission, you commissioned a study, a Fitch study that came back. Um, I guess, I don't know whether it was a leak this week, but we're glad it did because it's now public before the uh, commission gets it on Tuesday, but we can report from that report, 130 pages worth, um, some pretty concerning uh, details, response times, the technology of the system, the facilities, uh, everything downhill for the last six years. And to be fair, it wasn't all bad, but but we focus on those things that do need fixing, of course. Um, one really glaring thing in September, there were only nine days in September where 90% of the calls were actually answered in 15 seconds or less in an emergency, that's eternity. Uh, the Broward Sheriff's Department wants control, and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas's Public Safety Commission advises giving total control to BSO. What say you? Well, this is coming Tuesday, as you stated, they will, the commission will be discussing this in a very detailed manner. The good news is that the Fitch report, in which we actually paid for as a county, provided some recommendations. Again, this is a draft report. We'll see the final report at the end of December of this month. And we look forward to that, but on a high level basis, they have uh, provided about 10 different areas in which we need to improve, which a lot of it we already are doing. But more importantly, the discussion will be uh, with our board is whether we do turn everything over to the Broward Sheriff's Office, do we take everything back? Everything is on the table for discussion this coming Tuesday. Yeah, well, we have seen in some past meetings where this has been discussed, uh, raised voices, your colleague, Michael Udine, former Broward mayor, and Sheriff Gregory Tony were pretty much shouting at each other. Uh, and uh, how are you gonna kind of keep the lid on things Tuesday? What do you expect? Well, that was actually Commissioner Bogan, not uh, former mayor Michael Udine that had that uh, discussion with the sheriff. But I've actually spoke to both individuals and said this is gonna be meaning that we're gonna be professional and we're gonna be courteous to each other. So I, I have every confidence uh, in my board and the sheriff uh, that we will have a genuine conversation because at the end of the day, we have to collaborate together to make the system better for our community. And so we need to work collectively to make that happen. So hopefully everything will go smoothly on, on Tuesday. You know, Mayor, um, as the as Broward's commission goes, you are a vote on the commission. And um, as mayor, though, you get to sit in that chair and answer our questions. And sometimes they can get pretty pointed. Um, sure. But at that meeting that you were talking about, Commissioner Bogan, after that, I think it was, he actually had mm -hmm. recommended Gregory Tony's removal as Broward sheriff over this very mm -hmm. issue. Is and so the pointed question to you, the mayor, is that something that you would support or oppose? I actually think it was not the rule of the sheriff, it was actually to remove the Broward Sheriff's Office from handling the staffing and the communications component and take everything back, technology and staffing together. So I, that, I'm, that a, I'm actually to gonna, I, I will um, absolutely did I, did fact check that, that, but I think I the, quote, the quote that we have is removal of Gregory Tony. Um, but hopefully, um, like, let's see if we can get a fact check on that. But I have that quote. My impression was he meant the sheriff. I think that might have been a heated moment at that particular time. So I did not see our board uh, going in that direction in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, Mayor Fisher, um, I want to cite a story that our colleague Jeff Weinzer here at Local 10 News did this past week which was just heartbreaking, I guess you saw it. It involved a Hollywood resident named Delroy Burgess. 
October 31st, he got a call from his wife, 65 years old. They've been married 35 years. She was having trouble breathing. He rushed home and found her in distress. And he called 911. There was no answer. He waited a couple of minutes, called again. There was still no answer. There's Mr. Burgess there in the video. And eventually, 14 minutes later, uh, a Hollywood police officer and fire rescue showed up and tragically, uh, Mrs. Burgess died. Uh, I mean, this is just unspeakably sad and totally unacceptable, I'm sure you would agree. I agree, Hi, Bristol, Michael, and first of all, our prayers uh, go out to, to him and his family uh, during these um, healing hearts that are needed for this horrific event that happened. Yeah. And, it, and it should not happen. And what's also interesting, what I won't actually tell folks is that please, when you do call, please stay on the line. A lot of the abandoned calls, the, about 61% of the abandoned calls actually are folks that do not stay on or five seconds or less. So we want to make sure that please stay on the line the best you can in order to get that service. But this has to be corrected, Michael, without a doubt. So what is it, you know, in, in the minute that we have left, for, from what you know, because you have a lot of insider knowledge with the process that's transpired over the past year, wh what is a big priority fix? I believe the, the big priority fix is being able to, obviously, and we're doing that with our updating of our Viper 7, which is to be able to automatic call back, number one. Uh, number two is to be able to track that cell phone 80 percent of the calls now to 911 are via cell phone and so the technology has to be updated we have already uh, um, uh, have motorola's proposal and have accepted that proposal to make that rapid response happen so we can actually track not only the police officers and the firefighters folks on the radios but able to self the 911 call on a cell phone that we can actually ping that individual so we can see exactly where they're at yeah Mayor Lamar Fisher of Broward County, we are so glad to be able to speak with you. Congratulations. You know, you are the, the man in charge for the next year, you know, at the helm in Broward. And uh, good luck with fixing the 911 system. Thanks, Mayor. Look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. U.S. lawmakers pass the Respect for Marriage Act. South Florida's LGBTQ community applauds that with some reservations. That is next. With a Senate vote in favor this week and the expected passage in the House, the Respect for Marriage Act is well on the verge of becoming law. It would require all states to recognize as legal marriages from other states, including same-sex and interracial marriages. Congress passed it as a preemptive strike of sorts against any potential future attempt in the courts to overturn those protections for same-sex marriage and interracial marriage. The bill, which was opposed by both Florida senators, is a big victory for the LGBTQ community and everyone who supports its position. Orlando Gonzalez is the executive director of SAVE, that is an acronym for Safeguarding American Values for Everyone, and a leading voice in LGBTQ issues. Orlando, waving back to you. I know you can't see us, but thanks so much for being with us. Orlando, great to see you. So thank uh, you, Glenn and Michael. Great to be with you this morning. We're so glad you're here. So uh, the the fact that you know that this bill is going to pass in the it passed the Senate, will pass the House. Already passed a version uh, in July, and President Biden says he'll sign it. I mean, this is really a huge moment for the country, but especially for the uh, LGBTQ community. Absolutely, this is really a momentous uh, period in time. Any time that a Supreme Court decision and a law can be passed, essentially codifying uh, some rights as much as possible or any kind of legislation, that is really tremendous. Um, and I say that with some trepidation because the bill is not totally ideal. Uh, it has some provisions in it in which um, it pulled back some of the rights that were given in the Supreme Court case, um, but we'll take what we've got for now and keep fighting. Explain that. What, what kind of pullback do you mean? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So. Um, this bill sort of contains three pieces, right? So the first piece is that it repeals DOMA, which is the, the Defense of Marriage Act that was signed by President Clinton in 1996. And essentially what that did is it 
define marriage as being between one man and one woman. So it pulled that back. Um, the next thing that it did is that it issued uh, a requirement that states must recognize marriage licenses from other states. Now, the most unideal sort of situation is this third point, and that is that they removed the requirement that states must issue licenses. And so right now, marriage licenses are a patchwork of laws all throughout the country, and so not everybody um, has uh, a provisions that support that. Here in the state of Florida, we have two conflicting pieces, right? We have our constitution that says that marriage is defined between one man and one woman. That was done in 2008 uh, with uh, amendment number two. But then at the same time is that we have a Florida Supreme Court case that does allow for marriage. And so those two are in conflict. They've never been codified and rectified together. And so there is that piece that in terms of requiring states to issue licenses, becomes a bit of a game of jeopardy for many of the states out there, including our state, I believe. So there will be some challenges coming up. Um, I think that the upcoming legislative session that starts in March um, will be uh, pretty brutal for us. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just was going to say, uh, as you well know, and as Glenna reported earlier, both Senators uh, Rubio and Scott voted uh, against this, and both of them said that they were afraid that it's going to impair somehow religious liberty in this country. Uh, please, well, here's the statement, in fact, from Marco Rubio. Religious organizations, including orphanages, women's shelters, and schools, would likely be subject to crippling lawsuits if the so-called Respect for Marriage Act becomes law. Respond to that, Orlando. Uh, is, are his fears uh, genuine, or is that just political? It's political. You know, I, I, I want to make sure to note one thing, and that is that several amendments were made to the bill. One that was introduced by Senator Rubio, and one of those was removing the ability to uh, uh, sue states whenever uh, marriage licenses wouldn't be added. So he added an amendment that would be able to protect uh, people from, from discriminating from others because of, of marriage licenses. I think it's hypocritical to propose an amendment and then not vote in favor of the bill when you're making an amendment to soften its blow. Um, the other thing that I want to make sure that is really uh, noted is that the bill, the way that it's written, makes uh, an enormous position that actually supports religious freedom. Those of us in the LGBT movement and in human rights movements have always supported religious freedom, right? And so there's a, a, a way to be able to support religious freedom by being able to put some guardrails on it so that we are able to both have religious freedom and, out and have the human rights as much as possible. And what I mean by that is that in the bill, just like in the Equality Act, there is a shout out to RIFRA, right? The, the, the bill that was created back when uh, President Clinton was also in office, it's the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. And that bill clearly outlines that there are protections for ministerial acts. In other words, no bill would be created or no law would be created that would force a religious institution to conduct yeah. a gay marriage, right? So there's no, there's no way that we're gonna push a religious institution to force them to conduct a religious uh, same-sex uh, marriage ceremony. On the contrary, what we do look at is saying, hey, there's a math teacher working at a religious school. That person shouldn't be fired or lose their job because they're there to teach math. They're not doing anything that's ministerial. So these are really nuanced provisions and they're really careful and I think that they're really well thought out. So when Ruby or Scott sort of make these claims, they are really giving the mass populace a very lazy excuse for why they are bigoted in the way that they vote. You know, this Orlando comes about in the wake of overturning in Dobbs Roe versus Wade, um, which in its language was really specifically about abortion and abortion rights and its overturning. Um, this, we sort of characterize it as a, a preemptive strike. Um, and it's important to note that the ban on same-sex marriage is still on Florida's books and people are able to get married because of the 2015 court case. So does this, you know, marriage is a, is a state's rights, abortion is state's rights. Is, is this going down the same path, do you think? Yeah, it's possible. It's totally possible. And, and definitely, you know, when, when the Roe v. Wade decision was reversed, um, uh, Judge Thomas made a very clear statement saying that there were other cases that needed to be reviewed, prior Supreme Court cases that stand in precedence. And so that included the Ogrefell case, that includes the Loving case, which covers interracial marriages. And so these threats are very real. 
the last two legislative sessions with Governor Ron DeSantis at the helm of the state, we've seen lots of threats against our community. And so really, whenever there's a new yeah. low, it's no surprise. It's what we yeah. expect from our current uh, legislative yeah. body that is there and what we expect from the traditional anti-LGBT right. legislators. Orlando, I'm going to have to jump in. We are out of time. Very glad to have you on our program today. And uh, congrats on... You know, a law which is good for all of us. We appreciate you. Thank you, Glenna and Michael. Great to see you. Thank you. All right, up next, I'm going to sit down with Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar. You'll hear her response to my questions about immigration reform and that dinner that President Trump had with Kanye West and Nick Fuentes. Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar of Miami easily won re-election last month. She beat Democrat Annette Tadeo. Representative Salazar is a conservative Cuban-American but doesn't always fit stereotypical ideas about what that means. She is a former TV anchor and reporter at home in front of a camera. And on Friday, I sat down with her for a talk and we began with a subject she is passionate about, immigration. You were a first-time candidate. You have been advocating for comprehensive immigration reform. And as we all know, it has not happened. With the Republicans controlling the House, uh, is it possible that there could be that kind of reform? Of course. What do you mean is not happening? It's going to happen. Why? But, because but it has been... not happened. Yeah. Well, it has not happened, but it will happen within the next two years now that we, the Republicans, we are in, in charge. Like you said, in the last two years, I've spent most of my time talking to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, right. asking them, how can we fix immigration? I have gathered a lot of information, and I am happy to inform you that I will reintroduce my Dignity Act within the next few, I mean, after the new year. Right. And I'm going to not only do the illegal part, but I'm going to incorporate a new reform for the legal immigration. We have a major problem in this country and the yeah, Dignity we, Act will fix almost everything. Yeah, let Secure me just the jump border, in. Uh, it, Congresswoman, uh -huh. let me jump in. You know, this will happen if uh, Speaker Designate Kevin McCarthy gets behind it. Has uh, Mr. McCarthy told you, in fact, he will support your Dignity Act? Well, the Dignity Act is now in flux, as I told you. We are re refurbishing it. We are refining it. We are incorporating the different opinions of both parts of, of both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's going to be a, a better bill that will also include legal immigration. And look, we are at a point in this country where both parties understand and recognize that we have a major mess at the border. You're right. We have problems with the economy. We need hands to work. We have supply chain problems. We have high inflation. And my bill, with all humility, I believe will solve all those problems overnight. Yeah. And on top of that is the moral right Christian thing to do. Congresswoman, let me, our time is going to be limited here, but I want you to comment on the situation in Venezuela. As you know, the Biden administration has managed to get together uh, the Maduro regime and Juan Guaido, head of the opposition, for talks yep. about somehow making that government more small d democratic. And also, to part of the deal would be that three billion dollars uh, in Venezuelan government money, which has been sitting in an escrow account, would go to humanitarian aid to help Venezuelan exiles and others in the country. Uh, are you in yeah. favor of this? Is this a good idea? Look, as you know, this is pretty complicated, but we are always in favor of finding democracy anywhere in the hemisphere. I do believe that the Maduro regime always has a, a hidden agenda. And that Maduro, as he's done it in other occasions, always finds this conversation or these peace talks to buy time. Right. Um, I have been talking to some parts of the opposition, the Venezuelan opposition, 
Who are we to say to Guaido, don't sit with the with the, this dictator? I think that we should include other members of the uh, Venezuelan opposition, including Maria Corina, including Leopoldo Lopez. It's up to the Venezuelans, but I always forewarn them, as I have to the Colombian, the uh, President Petro's representative, whom I just had a good conversation with. I said, you've got to be very careful, because what we need to see is free, uh, um, ele free uh, elections in Venezuela with international observers, right. where the Maduro regime will have to give up part of his, of his um, power market share. Right. You know, it's up to them, but I'm going to be very observant and sure. obviously uh, uh, vigilant and respectful of whatever the Democratic, the uh, Venezuelan opposition wants to do. Right. And Congresswoman, as you well know, I'm sure uh, the Chevron Oil Corporation out of Texas would also in this deal have the right to really up its production of oil yeah. uh, out of Venezuela would add 200,000 barrels per month, I believe, to what it produces. And some of that oil would be brought to the United States again for refining. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That seems like yeah. sort of a win-win, doesn't it? Of course. Of course. And I think the Biden administration should have um, asked for more democratic concessions and not just give everything to uh, the Maduro regime, which is exactly what they want. They want to bring the American companies to help them refine that oil anywhere in the world and mm -hmm. just get those dollars. It's a problem because we know that Maduro, just like the Castros and just like all these tyrannical regimes, all they want to do is they want to have that economic oxygen to continue right. repressing uh, their, their people. I mean, it's the same. I, I do not. It, it happens all over and over again. And that's why with the United States and I'm part of the world of, of the um, Foreign Affairs Committee, I'm always saying, hey, we want to negotiate with anyone, but they have they have to play by the democratic rules. Right. And, they, and sometimes the Biden administration forgets that, Mike, but, you know, it's, and I don't get it. You cannot play ball with those who are yeah. brutalizing their people on the streets, and period. They are, they are not the most trustworthy people in government. All right, uh, Maria Elvira Salazar, hold on a minute. We're going to take a brief break. Be back with more questions. In just a oh. Kevin McCarthy has going, is going to have a very small majority when he takes over as the House Speaker, he's going to have 220 Republicans, 213 Democrats. And what a lot of analysts are afraid of, and maybe you as well, is that yeah. some of the radical right wing members of the Republican Party, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, are going to sort of have his ear and help drive the agenda. Are you worried about that? Well, let me tell you, uh, I hear that all the time. I'm here in Congress, um, and we're going to be here all next week and uh, uh, up until uh, Christmas, probably. Look, Nancy Pelosi had the same majority, maybe three or four seats. And she, according to my position, destroyed the economy by being able to pass all those bills that spend more than we needed to. And that's why we have the inflation we have. So I don't see why Kevin cannot do the same thing in trying to fix what Nancy undid with the same type of majority, four people, a, a, a very slim uh, majority. Let's give them the chance. We, we promised the, the American people that we were going to try to fix the economy, steal the border, respect parents' rights in knowing what their kids are studying. We're, we, we promised uh, very specific norms. I'm going to give the opportunity to Kevin to be able to bring those bills to the floor. We're going to vote on, in my case, you know, I'm pretty independent. I'm one of the most bipartisan members of Congress. Uh, you have I been, vote, indeed. what, 27? I, yeah. Of course. Yeah, we, because we understand that. So uh, let, let's see. Let's give, them, let, let's give them the opportunity because what we do know, Michael, is that the American people decided to give the Senate to the Dems and the House to the Republicans. And that's the beauty of this system. Yeah. Let the system play out. And, and American and, and voters forces, like uh -huh. it that way. In fact, they like yeah. in many ways a split Congress. Uh, Congresswoman, let me go back to the Tell immigration me. subject for a, 
you know, a topic near and dear to you and frankly dear to me as well, which is the fate of the dreamers. I mean, here we have these thousands of young people, well now people in their 20s, even their early 30s who are brought here as children. They've built lives for themselves, they contribute to society, but they live in this kind of legal limbo. How is that going to be resolved? But look, Michael, you're telling me and you're talking to me about the dreamers. We're talking DACA. But I go further and deeper. Why don't we talk about those people who have been here in this country for more than 20 years, let's say, and they have been in the shadows and they are not DACA, they are not DAPA, they are not TPS. These are regular people who have been contributing with the economy and we and the big entrepreneurs have given them jobs for for decades. Right. And thanks to those people, we have food on our table. So I'm talking about everyone that the Dignity Act gives dignity to the DACA, to the Dreamers, to their parents, to so the TPS, and to your, all. They're covered of by course, your act as well? Of course. Yeah. I need you to read my bill, and I need you to be one of those advocates. Because my dignity bill, it covers, and you know, a brown girl from the hood, a Hispanic girl from Little Havana, is the one telling uh, telling both sides of Democrats and Republicans that we need to fix the immigration. And I'm very happy that you're bringing up that topic because with a good immigration law, good immigration reform, we're going to fix four things that we have. We're going to be able to, to overnight have millions of workers because we have a great labor shortage. Number two is going to, is a moral thing to do. Number three, we're going to seal the border and no more fentanyl, no more coyotes. And number four, we're going to fix inflation. Immigration is the big problem, one of the big problems in this it, country. It is indeed. I have one and last I'm the question. only member. I'm Be- the only member who created an immigration reform bill last the last cycle. I, and now that I got reelected. The- uh, I'm yeah. the only one I, in both I, parties we, because the Dems did not dare to put up on the floor because we, they knew that we're not going to have the vote. We remember one final question, purely political. Recently, yeah, as you know, political, okay. former, former President Trump had at Mar-a-Lago for dinner, yay, yeah. Kanye West, yay, and a white nationalist, white supremacist named Nick Fuentes and really yeah. has not sort of apologized for having anti-Semitic white nationalist to dinner with him. What's your view on that? Yeah, well, you know, he didn't call me to ask me if he should have invited these two gentlemen. We also know that the empirical evidence is that Trump was one of the uh, was one of the giants for the Jewish community in this country. And he dared yeah, what to do. Signal is to, what does this well, send to, I, I, what to does Jewish it say? Americans, I, you know, that he is sitting down with anti-Semites? I think that, T, like I said, I would have not done it. I would have not invited them because anything that sounds or smells anti-Semitic is not good for me, is not good for the country because right. th- they are a very important community in this country. But at the same time, I have to see what he did during his presidency. And, uh, and, uh, and I can only say to you that he dared to move that embassy from yeah. to Jerusalem and so many people yeah. uh, reacted against him and he still did it so i i understand what you're saying i do not understand why they were there i would have not done it but still he has an impeccable record when it comes to the jewish american relations we thank you so much for being with us this hour and remember as always stay informed get involved